I want to try something differently. All right. Well, I guess we're done then. Um, no, no, I was just uh, – sorry, I, I was on mute there. Um, <laughs> well, and, I was, and I also just kind of read a comment too about um, – so, so we're talking about not being able to trust Trump or not being able to trust you know, Biden or Kamala or Mike Pence. Um, and someone mentions that, well, Joe Jorgensen is not going to, not going to get a lot of energy, you know, not going to, not going to win. Um, she's lucky to get 1%. So what? I mean, if, do, do, do you think you should vote just because you think that your guy is going to win if you vote for him? Like if, if you vote for Trump and Trump loses, did you waste your vote? Did you, uh, throw your vote away? Did, did it not mean anything at that point? No, we're, you, you you should vote for the person who you want to win because you're that's the only way that you can actually send a message. So we have polling, but nobody believes polling anymore. We have when you call your representatives, well, they're only getting a small percentage of people calling them. So they have a, a larger weight behind them. So how do politicians really know how the voters feel except by the voting? And if you start seeing more and more people voting for third parties or for other candidates than them, they're going to start wondering why, and they're going to pivot. They're going to change. That's how we got a lot of the drug legalization that's going on right now is because people like libertarians would be there saying, um, this is important to us. And if you don't vote or if, if you don't give us what we're looking for on these areas, we're going to vote for your opponent. Well, they're going to change and try and incorporate that into their message, into what they're, they're planning to do. They'll, they'll pivot that and, and and it'll become their idea it'll become the the democrats achieve this or the republicans achieve that but if those are things you care about you don't really care at that point you just want those implemented the right way and the way to do that is to send that message and the only way to send the message is to vote for the people who are talking about those things and who are making those things be be important right yeah like i'm not gonna lie to you uh I, I've only seen lower ballot races win in the uh, in these local races. Libertarian Party people do win. There's several elected officials here in Indiana at the libertarian level. But your vote is registered. It shows that you're a protest vote. It shows that you're rejecting the 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 immorality and the principles of the two party system. It shows it isn't you're you're opting out of the self protect you know the the idea that Republicans will fight Democrats and Democrats will fight the other like you're actually voting for somebody that reflects your values and it's registered and the more people that make that choice the more that's going to grow and the more people more it grows people will start to look and go oh they have a shot they have a chance. Um, libertarianism has grown exponentially over the last decade since I've been around. Like when I started calling myself a libertarian in the 2000s, I had to explain what that was. I still kind of have to explain what it is, which is what libertyexplained.com is about. But it's a common topic of conversation now. Libertarian ideas are more accepted by the mainstream. We need to reach out to those, to that, third of the country that doesn't vote because they don't see their voice represented. That's why we do this show is to talk to the people that don't feel that they're represented by their government. Um, so secondly, it's, it's a matter of free speech and fighting for ballot access laws and, and changes and ending gerrymandering. And, you know, people like Matt Gates and Ro Kahana uh, who are on opposite sides of so much in Congress, both agree on things like term limits and, drawing drawing districts that are not gerrymandered that are, are drawn by ai libertarians agree with that too there is a critical mass on some of these major issues so neither of these two candidates have earned your vote you know now joe jorgensen has to earn your vote too it's I totally understand if you look at this and go i'm opting out i heard jason stapleton say on his show the other day i'm opting out of this totally I'm not even going to worry about politics because it, it just doesn't, I don't want it to 
affect my emotions anymore. It doesn't affect my life anymore. I'm, I'm opting out. I'm, I'm going to build something better. I'm going to build a better mousetrap. And Jason is great at explaining and helping people do that. Um, and I love politics too much to kind of focus on that. And that's why I do this kind of show. Um, but uh, I, I'm not going to lie to you that the Libertarian Party is dysfunctional. Like the other two parties, the Libertarian Party is an organization of broken human beings like every other party or organization the, the libertarian party has no power you you will not win a lot of elections it will suck the first time you run for office and get three percent and you may never recover from it. it it's hard but at least you look when you look in the mirror you don't feel disgusted with yourself voting for a complete hypocrite uh let's hear what joe jorgen her jorgensen herself has to say the first part is from the 96 vice presidential uh, run that she had, and the second is from this run here. Thank you, Mr. McGovern. Thank you. Uh, let me, uh, I'm going to have to do some fancy editing. I, I pulled the wrong clip. Uh, stop screen share, share screen. Take that out. We'll take a, the videos. The, the video is so good. We, man, and then I just completely. All right, John up. Dvorak. I know. <laughs> the question was, why vote for a third party candidate? My answer is because the only party offering what you want is a third party, the Libertarian Party. I think the only wasted vote is one for Trump or Biden because they're going to give us more of what we don't want. Uh, if you want higher taxes, if you want more bungling in government, if you want to keep the troops all over the world, if you want more pollution, if you want more expensive health care, then by all means vote for Trump and Biden. I would say if you want something different, vote for something different, which would be the Libertarian Party. And I'd also like to point out that we can also make change even without being elected uh and then let's take a look at this video from george mcgovern uh, i believe did mcgovern run at one point third party i don't think he ran third party the he just i don't remember i'll have to look that up but uh right. i i know that he was considered kind of a, a you know kind of a libertarian type of figure, but not then um, basically both parties didn't like him. And it, even his own party was kind of not too happy with him. Yeah. There, so uh, I'll be voting for Joe and Spike, but I can't say I'm enthusiastic about it. Go check out Spike's YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. I, I encourage everybody because I was not hot on Joe either. And I can't say that I still am. I, I was critical of her selection. Um, but I'm I uh, Spike has really impressed me a lot. And if you go and the whole point of a, an LP presidential campaign is you're the marketing person for four years for the, like this is the only time I've said it a million times. It's the only time your friends and family are ever going to openly invite you to screech at them about libertarianism. What do you think of the the libertarian? You know, I'm in the barber shop yesterday and the, the guy goes, what do you what do you who's the libertarian running? Gary was kind of goofy, so is this one better? You know, they had an awareness of Gary Johnson. They have no idea who Dave Smith or, you know, Nick Sarwark are, but they know who Gary Johnson is, just your average Joe on the street. Um, and so... And, and, and that was because the media gave him the attention. I mean, that was the big problem. So you can sit there and you can shout to the heavens and try to make your case and, and put out videos and social media and make all the trips and interviews that you can get your hands on. But if the if the media doesn't give you the that voice that platform to to expand on that to make that uh, known to the people who aren't really invested or looking into it, it's not going to go anywhere. And that was the thing about Gary was that he was considered um, viable enough by the media that it made sense for them to give him those interviews. And he was doing hundreds of miles you know, CNN interviews, you know. MSNBC, CNN, they were, he was doing three or four of those a day, right? Where he was on the screen talking to people um, on those platforms. Whereas 
you know, previous to that, that didn't happen. And I don't think it's happening again this year. We're just not getting that, that traction. And it's, it's more of a perception from the media than it is anything else. Yeah. But, but I will say that their campaign spike and Joe as evidenced by spikes channel are like, I was going through Liberty explain.com is the new website that we're um, pumping out material to help. Like there's not really a great resource for like newbies. Like I, I, people kept asking me like, Hey, do you have a website or a book or whatever? And I'm just like, there's nothing really comprehensive or good that like is a well-organized thing. And so that's what we're building. We're about to start launching the, the podcast, Liberty Explained. You can already subscribe to it. Uh, but the website is up and filled with all kinds of different resources. And, you know, going through the, uh, and building out our video playlists that you can find on our YouTube channel. Um, you know, when you go through the movement stuff, Harry Brown had almost everything Harry Brown did in 96 and 2000 is still relevant and I could use and post to the website. Gary Johnson didn't have a lot except a couple drug videos. Like there, you know, he, the criticism that he was light on, on policy that he didn't know who his cabinet would be, that he didn't have a lot of his campaign, didn't talk about the message. That's all valid. And so Jorgensen is the correction in the party on that. And it's still not good enough. And so I ex- mm-hmm. at, a, at a certain point, when, when Dave Smith says he doesn't understand Joe Jorgensen's messaging, I have to think he's not really paying attention to their campaign. And he says he's an expert in politics, and I don't know what campaign he's ever worked on. I've worked on hundreds of campaigns. I was the executive director of the Libertarian Party of Indiana for four years. You know, that's where I met Reinhold when he ran for office. And this whole, you know, the, you know, Joe Jorgensen said it was a great when Biden picked a woman. So I'm tired of this lame feminism in the LP. Well, I'm sorry. There are a lot of people. There is this instinct within especially the Mises crowd, the Mises caucus, to think that the candidates should target their messaging specifically to you. And if you are not happy with their message, then the whole campaign sucks and it's not worthy and I'm not voting for you and I'm going to stomp my feet and walk out. I know. Oh, calling it a tantrum is childish. But frankly, out of hundreds of tweets, you pick one that was very innocuous when the lifespan of a tweet is 20 minutes and 7% of the country is on Twitter and nobody thinks Twitter is real life and it's completely inconsequential. We're going to beat up Joe Jorgensen on not running our own Twitter and not tweeting out the right things. That tweet was a tweet from a woman two other women specifically of left-leaning virtue. And then she had eight tweets bashing Kamala Harris's record. That wasn't what was important. It was the fact that she was reaching out to people that, that had cognitive dissonance with a certain vein of the movement. And there just has to start, like we cannot as a party, we're not, and I will not allow with my voice, I will speak up and say, this campaign is giving the purity crowd exactly what they wanted. And they're still not happy about it. So I have to think that they're not going to be happy and they're going to try and wreck another presidential cycle with tantrums because they aren't being talked to directly because they think that they're the center of the universe. And that's not how this works. Like anti-leftism is not libertarianism. Like it's not the same thing. Yes, there are, you could say that this entire podcast, if you're a left-leaning person, this entire episode was probably uncomfortable for you. There are elements to it. But women, minorities, like the party has to reach out to other people. And that means that they're going to talk to other people that don't look like you, think like you, and talk like you. Spike, you know, again, she didn't, she, can, Darla says she praised Biden for picking Kamala. Come on. That's not what she said. Nope. Just. It, they, these, the, here's what happens. It's like weld with Clinton. These these things get into this echo chamber and get repeated until you're saying things that are not accurate. It's like the the Infowars article and Ron Paul Institute article about Joe Jorgensen saying that she she thinks that you should be fired for cancel culture or whatever. If you read what she said, if you listen to the interview, it's not what the headline of the Ron Paul Institute article said. But that has now become gospel because people don't go back and actually look at the original source. And it becomes a tool to bludgeon 
an, an internal opponent. And so my main criticism with the Mises caucus is that they're the ones that invented caucusing. And so in every, instead of everybody kind of working together, because what used to happen is that after the presidential candidate was selected, people weren't happy, but they would generally work for the candidate. That stopped last cycle, and it's continuing this cycle. There is no unity because one faction wants to tear down the other factions with dismissive and rude language and saying this person's not pure when this is the most pure candidate in the time in my time, since Ben Narek. You know, it, it's not helpful. And all it does is make us look dysfunctional because you're being intentionally dismissive, divisive. Like it, it, it makes it harder for shows like ours who are trying to reach out to new people, like to join the movement. Because when we did that survey of a hundred people of, of, you know, our audience and beyond, like what is the thing that turns you off from libertarianism the number one comment was the comments on your Instagram page. And who is the who is commenting on our Instagram page? It's the Hoppians. It's the it's the guys who are alt right adjacent. It is the people who every time we say the word black on our Instagram, give us 300 comments of why racism doesn't exist. And you guys are a bunch of less left wing SJW assholes like you're hurting the movement. And everybody's seeing it for what it is. And everybody's starting to alienate you and give you negative feedback for that reason, for everything I'm saying. And instead of going, hmm, all this negative criticism from people who are not, there isn't a star work around every corner. So why am I getting so much negative social feedback? You double down and you just start name calling even more. And people are jumping off your ship left and right. I was, when the, when the Mises caucus came in, I said, great, because the fight before the Mises caucus was the Ron Paul campaign for liberty, Mises crowd put down the Libertarian Party and made it a joke and said, join the Republican Party. And it was and it wasn't good for the movement because it was creating a division. So when the Mises caucus came in, I was glad because I would hope that it was going to heal that rift. But now we have people who continually bash everything going on in the party so they can gain power. That's fucking ridiculous. And it's childish. And it's why, you, why you're told that you're tantruming. That's what it is. Because if you, you are tantruming. <laughs> right. That's the outside perspective from people that are not liberals, people that have just been around for a long time and are just tired of the drama. And so... You know, that's where we stand on it. Um, yeah. And I I'm mean, glad. They, so Darla says Dave Smith was the person who made me a libertarian. I, I'm i glad. Like, I'm not Sarwark. I don't want to push Tom Woods or Dave Smith out of the party. I think that they are a tremendous benefit to libertarianism. It's just my, that, it's just that yep. they're, not, they're not working well with everybody else. And I think it's for a specific reason. And it's bullshit. And they're getting... The negative feedback is for a reason, but it doesn't mean that they don't do a tremendous, especially Tom Woods, ha has done a tremendous service for the libertarian movement. I just don't right. like the loser brigade shit is so unhelpful and so divisive and it, and it creates a faction and then further divides people by factionalizing everyone and throwing everybody into that camp instead of having an honest. And I do, I do like that Dave Smith is starting to have Eric July is starting to have some of these people on to have these conversations, because I have to think that when you're starting to get feedback that is negative, like Dave Smith even said in, in his podcast, like I was surprised by the amount of pushback. This is why, like, because we're going to ruin another cycle with this, this, tantruming like you're mad about one tweet when twitter's not real life who gives a fuck if joe jorgensen runs her own twitter do we really care like joe jorgensen is spending her time going out and talking to voters or doing interviews on c-span like we just played that's what's important no like what it, it's just so frustrating like the the nitpicky bullshit that when your brand is built on punching the LP in the face and they're a joke and the messaging sucks and only I can save their messaging, like people just get tired of it and they start tuning you out and your effectiveness and your influence starts to wear out. And I'm just, 
And I've been pointing this out and I keep getting beat up for it, but I'm trying to help. I'm not, I'm not Sarwark. I'm not against the Mises caucus. I'm just saying you're hurting yourselves and you're hurting the movement at large. And I do actually care, which is why I pointed out. Like, I do actually care that Ron Paul's reputation is being tarnished by a bunch of conspiracy theorists and possible Russian assets like Daniel McAdams. Like, I love Ron Paul, and I'm mad about what the Ron Paul Institute constantly puts out. Like, I wouldn't say anything if I didn't give a shit about Ron Paul. You know, like, Dave Smith is a, a credit to the libertarian movement. You know, right. it, it's just... But he's, but he's not infallible. He doesn't... And that's that's what really irritates me is when we have people who are brought into the, the movement, um, whether you've been brought in through by, um, you know, Harry Brown or you were brought in by Ron Paul or you were brought in by Dave Smith or Tom Woods. Um, once you are brought in and you start to say, hey, I'm a libertarian, keep learning, keep questioning. Don't stop there. Don't just take that person's view and words and make them your own that's not being an individual that's not being actualized that's that's letting somebody else do your thinking for you become yourself question everything and and develop your own views on things right and and it's okay to disagree with people you know i can sit there and say that i think dave smith was wrong on uh, his defense of uh Molyneux because of race realism which isn't a real, you know, isn't a real thing, but he's trying to say it's factual. I can have my uh, opinions with Nick Sarwark and say, I don't think he should have done this or said this, you know, I no, my, my relationship with Nick yeah. ended when I criticized him publicly for going after Tom Woods. Yeah. And I had a private conversation with him at the national convention in 2018 and said, you need to stop because Tom Woods is a benefit to the libertarian party. And you're, you're needlessly dividing the movement by doing this. And he said, thank you. And then he kept doing it. And Nick and I have never had the same friendship as we had before that. My friendship ended because I defended Tom. But I'm yeah. sure that I would never get, you know, like what I care about is the movement. And this is why I'm often critical and, and talk about this inside baseball stuff. And maybe we should cut this out and like put this in <laughs> as a separate podcast. But um, because this isn't relevant to Kamal Harris. Um, yeah. But I care about the movement. Because I think we have tremendous potential. And when you look at the, the under 40 crowd, when you look at exit polling here in Indiana, for instance, for Lucy Brenton, and when she ran for Senate, under 40, we get 10% of the vote. And the Libertarian Party specifically gets 10% of the vote. And that's probably with a lot of Libertarians not, A, not knowing they're Libertarians, or B, not voting because they didn't like Lucy or whatever. Like, I think the, the, the millennial and Zoomer libertarian vote is enormous and i think we are at a point where buckley was in 1950s in the 1950s where if you have a national review type organization that can unite the various clans of libertarianism and we can all get on the same page and start working together we can build a movement that starts to have significant power as these old two parties start to fish for their identity if Biden gets elected, the left is going to eat itself for, for political power because he's a weak president, just like under Carter. If Donald Trump loses, the, the right is going to be searching for a new identity because Donald Trump ruined the identity that they have. Like we are on the precipice of libertarianism flourishing because of technology. And we can ruin that and we can continue all this bullshit and quibble over cultural issues that don't matter instead like the number one issues in our survey were taxes lowering the cost of living inflation uh health care lowering the price of health care like that's what people want they don't want the cultural stuff and if you go and look at like like as i was scouring all this stuff if you go look at any of the think tanks in the libertarian movement but but mises highlights it best you go back and look at the stuff that they were doing under obama or in 2013 like it was all economics, it was taxes, it was traditional libertarian orthodoxy. And over the Trump era, it has become cultural issues. And that's not what people are looking for. Like, uh, you know, let's see. Uh, let's see here. Uh, there's a comment I wanted to respond to. 
Um, and, and that's why I think Spike was totally right on, on on Dave Smith. Like they were both, if you haven't listened to Spike Cohen on Dave Smith, it was a great conversation. He, you know, they were super respectful of each other. And, and I agree wholeheartedly with Spike. Uh, I think he made the libertarian case for why systemic racism exists, why we should partner with people we don't agree with to fight, fight it. Um, I, I don't buy the idea that there is uh, this massive left infiltration um, you know, the the reality is, uh, I'm uh, okay, so Darla says, I think people are just tired of hearing about how bad they are because of their non-existent white privilege. What I've tried to explain is that as I, I used to be the libertarian, and you go back and listen to the show, like, especially if you listen to, like, the Ferguson episode, um, I'm saying all the same things as a lot of, like, like a Dave Smith is saying now. But as I got out of my libertarian echo chamber and started going into more professional circles and I started, um, you know, because at the time I was just really still entrenched. All my friend groups were all in the libertarian party because I had worked in the libertarian party. You know, as I have expanded my circle into talking to people outside of my culture, outside of my bubbles, outside of my socioeconomic classes, I've realized that I had a tendency to think that everybody thought like me and that my definition of libertarianism was the definition. I had a tendency to um, deny other people's experiences, look at other explanations that I knee-jerk disagreed with as fake. And now that I kind of talk to a, a wider, broader range of people through my weekend radio show, through the pat-down, I'm I'm starting to realize that major criticisms generally all have some truth because they're coming from an experience in life that I don't have access to. I don't know what it's like to be a black man in America. I don't know what it's like to be a uh, a, a a lesbian black female, you know, and what different complications they have in life that I might have. And so there's a responsibility in some ways. We must reach out to people and and have conversations that aren't in our sphere and a big change in we are libertarians has been not just looking at things from my version of libertarianism trying to talk to my libertarians and share my experience and it's birds of a feather flocking together what i've tried to do is uh, on these types of shows try to get in the head of kamala harris and understand why she's making the choices she made you know, why does Mike Pence think the things that he does? You know, what are the shades of this? Like in, in the Joe Biden episode, it's easy to just go, Joe Biden's the devil and he's awful. But like, why did Joe Biden make the choices he made? And what does that say about him? You know, and talking to liberal friends, talking to other people, like not being narcissistic and thinking that my world is the world. And I think that happens a lot in the libertarian movement because the the nature of social media pushes everybody into you, your algorithm is what you like and they want to show you what you like, you know? And so when my commentary or criticisms hit differently and strikes you as odd or weird, it's because I'm trying and actively seeking out other opinions and asking like, what is it like doing this? What is it like doing that? And that's something I didn't ever do. Uh, and I, I don't think that many libertarian commentators often try to do that. I think they try to appeal to the libertarian base. And like, I'm, I'm glad that Joe Jorgensen is trying things that she thinks will bring in females, right? Like how long, how many, you know, she's, she's trying to message. And I think like they genuinely believe it. I hate when people say they're pandering to the left because what that, that's like saying that, like people recoil when you say that Dave Smith is dog whistling to racists. He's not. He genuinely believes what he says. And other people from different walks of life have a different perspective than he does. And they see it differently. Um, Joe Jorgensen, Spike Cohn has a different worldview than you. And so you can't just be mad at Spike Cohn for having a different worldview than you. You should figure out why he thinks differently than you. You know, the, but that's hard. Like that takes some effort instead of just going, 
this thing fits my confirmation bias, so I'm going to pick that out and, and use that. So um, I don't think that there is – I think we've just gotten lazy. Like I got really bummed out going – like I literally went through thousands of YouTube like videos on libertarian channels trying to, to curate these playlists because as people over the next like few weeks want to learn more about libertarianism, I want them to have – up to date resources, stuff that like oh, my cat is stuck. Yeah. So and a, and a wide breath of them. Yeah. Yeah. I want them to and, and yeah, like like I, I have always held because the, the experience of the Ron Paul people telling me to fuck off essentially when I worked for the Libertarian Party and putting down my efforts has never left me. And it was really insulting. And and there there is an element of disliking Ron Paul people as a result of it, but it's their doing, right? It's the Paul bots that that said, you know, you're wasting your time in the LP. That that just like, man, I know so. You know, when I was executive director, I was full time, and I was working with hundreds of Hoosier libertarians that put their heart and soul into their efforts, and would be bummed out by some Ron Paul campaign for Liberty douche you know, who would put down what they were doing and like, they'd get bummed out by it. And I'm just like, that's not cool. Like everybody who makes an effort, like their, their contribution should be valued unless their name is Chris Cantwell. Like <laughs> then, you know, they're like, that's why I look at Tom Woods and I go, there are things I dis like, I disagree with him on some of the COVID stuff, like two degrees. Like I don't, uh, I, I don't think that, you know, like Tucker, uh, Jeffrey Tucker is just on a different planet with some of this shit. Like when he's saying that lockdowns were invented by a kindergartner in 1997 or what, like what? Like they, they were doing, they were doing quarantining in the, in the 1918 pandemic. You're just like, you're misinterpreting information or intentionally like adjusting it to be manipulative. And so I disagree with him on that, but there isn't anybody in the movement in the last 20 years that has done more to free information and in and basically spread libertarian ideas than Jeffrey Tucker. Like he's the one who put the free ebooks on Mises.org. Like that, that contribution alone has been tremendous. So just because I disagree with him on one thing, it doesn't mean his contributions are worthless. And so I don't get when we go, I don't like this message that doesn't appeal to me. This whole campaign sucks. I'm not going to vote for them. Like it's very self-centered and it's very it, like it, it's not how a free society would work. Like you're going to, in a, in the free market have to interact with people that you don't agree with. And so why not start building those muscles on interacting with people that you don't necessarily agree with my understanding and debating of the left has become so much stronger because I'm going in week in week out across from Dion on the pat down who is a socialist and he's pushing me and I'm pushing him and we're meeting on, on common ground and finding places we agree. And it, I may be more left than I was five years ago on certain things, but it's because I realized like, Oh, I needed to do like, so I, I just think that a lot of the conversations that are coming out of the Mises caucus is self-centered and unhelpful. And it, and I feel that way because of 20 years of experience. And a lot of you guys are younger and don't know politics and don't understand politics. And you've been in it for two years. And I'm forgiving of that. But at the same time, leave everybody the fuck alone. Like, <laughs> you know, it's we're continuing this divide. So back in so the Cato Institute was started to push Murray Rothbard's ideas. The Koch brothers funded the Cato Institute so Murray Rothbard could have an economic think tank. And then Ed, Ed Crane came in and expanded the reach of it. And Murray Rothbard was unhappy that it went from being the Murray Rothbard Institute to a different mission. So he, he quit. And then one of the Koch brothers kept his stock in the Cato Institute in his safe. And they stole basically Murray Rothbard's stock. And so from then on, which not cool, right? And so both sides kind of bear some blame for some of this. And so what ended up happening is a Rothbardian versus Craniac war that's been going on for 40 years. 
And the millennial libertarians need to be the generation that just say enough of your drama. If you are a Rothbardian, you can be friends with a constitutionalist. If you are, if you are a minarchist, you can have a conversation with a mutualist. Our enemy is the state, not each other. And the Hoppians. Oh, fuck the Hoppians. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, like I, I don't. I, all I know is that I get when I get like swarmed on Twitter by the alt right guys. They always have Hoppa as their profile yeah. picture. Uh, but you know, it, it sort of makes you go, "All right, this brutalist mindset is prevalent in one central area." So, um, yeah, that that's where I come down on it. That's why I'm critical of it. I don't feel that I am irrational. I'm certainly not coming at it because you're right and I'm left and you know, I want you to, to agree with me. I'm just, I'm trying, I, I am uh, in politics. There are just a lot of different types and I'm a move. I'm a movement builder. Like that's what I've always cared about. I care about growing third party challenges to the two party state. Uh, I, I don't, I, I care about what makes a healthy movement why I eat oat bran every morning um yeah and, and when you mentioned the, the the splits that happened 40 years ago and and there's some quibble on whether or not those were stolen or if they were part of the the agreement but what it ended up happening was it got so bad that in 1983 the party split in half half of the party walked out and went and joined the Republicans. And that's why we ended up with a liberty movement inside the Republican Party, because the Republican Party was not liberty involved at the time. So they thought that they would try to convert the libertarian, the, the Republicans over to be libertarians. And it has been an invisible failure. Um, what happened, we, we had, you know, 50 state ballot access in 1980. We had uh, 1% of the vote uh, in 1980. And then by 1984, we're back down to under 40 ballot access or even less than that. We were getting 0.25% of the vote. It's because of that, that split because people couldn't work together anymore. Yeah. Right. They, they couldn't figure out common grounds. Libertarians, all the different sects of, of libertarianism have like 90% common ground. They disagree on a couple of things. They just disagree on those things so much that they're putting the line in the sand there. And it's, it's insane. So that was always my complaint when when the uh, Mises caucus first came in was Michael Heiss was advertising it as they were going to take over the party. And he, when in reality, that, I'll be honest, like having worked for the advocates for self-government in 2013, I was the marketing director of if you've ever taken the world's smallest political quiz or done an operation politically homeless outreach thing like that was what I did for 2013. And so I spent an inordinate amount of time because they were an entry point for the movement. It's it's since changed, which is why I built Liberty dot com to fill that gap as the advocates have shifted. Um, most of the libertarian party were were Rothbardians. They just didn't like the fact that the Rothbardian crowd were dicks to them about their political stance because they didn't want to be Republicans. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is the personal choices of a faction that made the LP somewhat hostile towards the other thing. And like we're at the point where like that has to just go away. Like, because the reality is, I don't know many, like, you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of libertarians, like hundreds a week because of people emailing or messaging or commenting or whatever. I don't know a lot of people. I know a lot of people who are on the beginning of the train. And then I know a lot of people who are anarchists. I don't know a lot of people like Ryan, who are lib libertarian socialists. Uh, I don't know a lot of people who are um, like like the Tyler Cowen types who want, you know, common good conservatism, but a libertarian version of it. I don't know many people who aren't anarchists, I guess is what I'm trying to say, like or aspire right. to be anarchists. You're not. But mm -hmm. like, I think that gun to your head, if you said a perfect world, you if man were OK, like I'm for a night watchman state because I don't think that private courts work. You know, uh, so I would be technically be a minarchist. 
right well my 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 whole contention on the on the anarchism stuff is is i think that anarchists have the same um the same issue that socialists have is that their their idea of the perfect world doesn't mesh with human nature right so there's a human nature aspect of wanting to have some sort of rule structure in place and some sort of government in place you've never seen an anarchist so i, I know spooner had said this and and uh anarchists say this a lot where they say that um the government we have failed to stop the government we have now right so trying to do a minarchist type of government with the with the um, the original constitution you know failed to prevent it growing and bloating and becoming what it is today well there's there's been no anarchist in society that has ever stopped from becoming a government society right when you have and part of it comes to being definitions of words right so what's a government you know or and what's a private organization so it when you break it down when you if you have two if you have three people living in an area and one person is is trying to overrun one or the two one of the other people and then those two people come together and defend because let's say they're weaker than the one who's stronger who's who's trying to tell them what to do when those two come together to become um a common defense against the third acting outside of what is acceptable boundaries that they are setting that's a government so even at that small of a level you still have something that you call a government now you can call it something else and then say we're anarchists because we don't believe in you know that government but you're still employing government at that point so there's always going to be rules for society that are in place they have to be enforced somehow the question is is how you do it and i think a lot of people get caught up in the in the words and the phrasing and and the definitions that they're choosing to use and not the ones that other people are choosing to use and, and using it as a as a divisive nature between uh different aspects of the of the philosophy yeah right? well, then, why are we fighting about the end state when <laughs> we're so far away from anything close to resembling what all of us would agree would be a better in state than what we have now right let's get the boat turned in the other direction and start getting more and more freedom and then we can have all the arguments and fights and quibbles over the minutia of what that in state looks like at that level why are yeah. we fighting about it now listen i was going to vote most likely i was going to vote for joe jorgensen or jacob hornberger or i probably would have even voted for adam kokesh you know what I mean? Like it, it's, and it's not because I'm a libertarian party, hardcore person. I'm not anymore. Like I used to be, but, uh, it, what are the it, options? It, what are my options? Right? Like yeah. say that I'm not going to vote for Joe Jorgensen because of a tweet when your options are not registering as a protest vote by opting out or voting for Donald Trump or Joe Biden. I just, the best green party the the best choice to me available is the libertarian party presidential candidate so mm -hmm. you know i i'm i'm a lot more forgiving of things i'm not uh i'm not a uh i'm i'm not a i don't i don't know how you'd say it i'm not a purist you know or i i i take people as they are i i tend to be the type of person who's like i'm going to trust everyone until they let me down you know, where I think a lot of people operate from a, I'm going to trust no one until they prove me wrong type of a mentality. And I think that's probably why I, I look at it differently. But, um, you know, one, uh, one other comment, Malice really goes hard after the LP. I think Michael Malice is brilliant. I loved the new right. I love Michael Malice in general. I think that's hack. I think that's really easy. I think if you are beating up on the Libertarian Party or making jokes at the Libertarian Party's expense, I think it's bad comedy. It's not even funny. Like if you're bringing up James Weeks, that's hack. Like just working in the comedy comedy world, like I can tell you that it's the equivalent of doing airplane food jokes or carrot top. It, yeah, like carrot top's way more brilliant than that joke. Like it's just in reality. So it's it's like the dad jokes of the libertarian movement. Uh and Aleppo Malice Malice is just better than that. I've seen him tweet things and say things that are like, oh, I wish I were even three quarters as smart as that guy. Half as smart. 
Um, but the, beating up on the LP, I really, what I really kind of think is, and I don't like, I think there's a certain wing of the libertarian movement that will not be libertarian in, in expressing themselves as a libertarian in two to three years. I think that the, the Hoppe crowd is going to break off of the libertarian movement once they realize they can't reform the party. They can only get 25% of the vote in the libertarian party. They're, they're constantly doing battle. Like at a certain point when you're fighting with someone every single day all the time and you open up your Twitter and it's nothing but fights, it's exhausting. That's why we're putting everything from 2013 or 2014 to 2017 behind the paywall. I just got tired of fighting with everybody all the time. That type of broadcasting is very exhausting. And so you either go, I got to do this differently so I can like keep my sanity or you like double down and go off and do your own thing. Like, I don't know. So I think there's a portion of the movement that, that is expressly libertarian that is just not going to be libertarian uh, in, in the next couple of years. And they're going to pursue a Bismarckian state of pure power politics. You know, when, when, you know, Dave Smith and Michael Malice have a conversation about why monarchy is good and democracy is bad. And then all of a sudden, and they're having a fully fleshed out conversation because this is part of the problem, so to speak. Uh, oh, that was so clever. Uh, <laughs> part of the problem, so to speak, uh, is that two intelligent people will have a nuanced conversation and then Hoppa bots or Paul bots will grab that and just echo that and repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And it distills down into grunting, basically. And then people hold the two people having the conversation accountable for the grunting. Well, that's stupid. Like, you know, if if a Dave Smith fan is tweeting hyperbolic things at me like they constantly do, I don't hold him accountable for it because he's not telling anybody to do that. You know, it's the person that is using the anonymous account to be an asshole that's responsible. It, it, it's just, uh, but when I see two weeks after that conversation, monarchy being discussed in libertarian circles for the first time ever, I go, these people want to, so, so Bismarck, why Bismarck in Germany pre-Hitler was um, important is that he he used the state essentially to preserve the power of the nobility the noble class the the elites and and used it to essentially and this is why the french revolution kicked off too is that they were conserving the power of the existing order and eventually that broke down because they went too far and then you get things like world war 1 weimar germany hitler and a pure power state internally never works. It's why socialism doesn't work. It's why Nazism didn't work. It's why Bismarckianism didn't work. But the idea that a monarch or a king will work versus democracy is foolish because mm -hmm. it, it's... So I think there is a wing of the libertarian movement currently that is being seduced by that idea of we can build a conservative state to fight the left when they don't look at the utilitarian view of it and say, Donald Trump is president now and can't do it. Like he's, we have the most, they'll say in one breath, we have the most totalitarian American state ever. And then in the next breath say, we need it to be more totalitarian because it's not going far enough when they're not achieving the goals that they say they do. So uh, I well, think that's, how the, that's how the classical liberal liberals got started. I mean, it was, um, Madison really, really was fighting against Hamilton. Hamilton wanted a monarchy, you know, and, and, and Adam or not Adams, but um, Madison was so against that. And that's how parties even got started. It was because of that fight over monarchism versus individualism. So we lost something. We, we had gone through an enlightenment period uh, during that time with what Locke had been writing and, and then what uh, Jefferson and, and Madison were pushing through. Um, that it was really fighting against the idea of a ruling class, a ruling state, a uh, a more individualist type of society, and it, it ended. I mean, we um, left the Enlightenment era uh, early early in the 1900s when we started going into more like, progressive ideas and more uh, back to more conservative stuff. So, you know, 
I, that's what libertarianism really is, is trying to get that back, trying to get that individualism that um, what what Jefferson said in his first inaugural address, where the best government is the one that prevents people from harming each other, but otherwise leaves them alone to to live their lives. Right. So and let them decide how things should be. And, you know, it, that's considered um, so fringe these days when it was almost the basis of what this country was founded on and both the republicans and the democrats have lost complete sight of that in their bid for trying to gain ultimate power to become that monarchy as it were they they want to destroy the other party and be in complete control of everything right they don't want to work with them anymore it, it's it's become such a split and it didn't always used to be that way but it's just getting worse and worse and worse and i don't know the answer to that other than just stop telling them no and quit giving them the power that they're abusing and, and coveting so much take it back yeah you know? um <clears throat> we got to start wrapping up because i have to go to some family stuff but uh in my opinion i don't think the liberty influence on the republicans has been a complete failure there is recognition of the liberty caucus within the republicans yes but the Freedom Caucus now is backing uh, a, a, an unconstitutional executive order to take the power, the initiation of spending for the president when it's only given to the House and the Constitution. Yeah, they um, keep it. And lie. then Thomas Massey, I think, will be running for president next time. Would you vote for him if he runs as a Republican? I would. I would vote for Thomas Massey. Um, but I will say that... Uh, Thomas Massey and Justin Amash are examples of how far right the right is going under Trump. And this is a cautionary tale for many in the Mises sort of world, the, you know, the people who, who listen to malice um, because he's expressly Hamiltonian. Um, the Justin Amash was the heir apparent to Ron Paul anointed by Ron Paul as the heir, heir apparent 10 years ago, uh, along with Rand and Massey. Well, you know, when we did the interview on the Chrissy and Jesse show uh, with Amash, I asked him out of my own personal glee, can you change it from the inside? And he said, absolutely not. It's unchangeable. It must be done from the outside, and the Libertarian Party is the best vehicle to do that. Justin Amash has not changed. And there are people within the libertarian movement who call Justin Amash a leftist. Well, Justin Amash was the heir apparent to Ron Paul. Massey is so far left to people in the Republican Party that they're trying to, to primary him. There's a great documentary on HBO called The Swamp that follows Massey and Matt Gates, And Massey is a decent guy who is constantly under attack by the president and his fellow freedom caucus people, because he's not blindly following the president. He's yeah, so we know somebody who, who assisted in that effort, didn't we? Yeah. And so he, he, he wouldn't vote for one unconstitutional thing. And so the next day he got a primary opponent by threat of the president. And so when Justin Amash have become leftist to you, you are too far right. And if anybody, that's a problem is influencing you, they're too far right, and they need to check themselves because Justin Amash is a constitutionalist, and, f and, and Thomas Massey too. They fit perfectly within the libertarian movement. Constitutionalists belong, the same as anarcho-capitalists and anarcho, I'd even say anarcho-communists. You know, part of the reason that I have been more vocal about the, the what I call the leave them alone strategy is because we had a libertarian socialist on our staff who ran the heretic. His name is Ryan Lindsay. He never advocated the violence of the state. He had different reasons for being a libertarian socialist. He had more leftist predilections and the way that he was treated was so even by our own Facebook group, which is one of the more uh, rational, nice Facebook groups. He was treated so poorly. He now is with the Democratic, uh, the the uh, Socialist Party of America, whatever they're called, the DFA. D DSA, yeah. DSA. He doesn't want to even associate with libertarians anymore because he was treated so poorly. He's become more socialist and less libertarian because of the way that the movement treated him. Now, maybe you think that's a good thing, but I don't because I learned a lot from Ryan. And I, I like that Ryan was a check and balance on my more conservative leaning libertarianism. Uh, and so I just think it's a shame that we can't in our movement in this day and age have the kind of conversations that 
Carl Hess and Murray Rothbard and Hazlitt and Hayek used to have. You know, it, it, it used to be about winning the 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 mines, right? Winning the the uh, the marketplace of ideas, right? And it's in order to have a marketplace, a free market, right? You have to have all the different types of people in there. And the same with I, the free marketplace of ideas, and you can't grow and become more con convinced about your opinion unless you continuously question it, and you counter it, you listen to other people give you why they think that it's not going to work. And then you have to think about that, process it and figure out what is the best answer. That's how you grow as a person by continuously questioning yourself. And I don't, when we talk about Massey, I don't see any scenario where Massey would win the nomination of the Republican party. But too far, uh, he, too far gone. Yeah, and not only that, it was never the Republican party is about conserving the, the, uh, the way things are, the, and, and libertarianism and liberty are not going to fit into that, and it never will. That's why it was so, um, so weird for them to try to to make that change and become the Liberty Caucus. The Liberty Caucus itself, um, what was the rule that uh, Liberty Caucus could not ever um, support a libertarian candidate? Yeah, they can never they can never say that that they put their uh, uh, backing behind a libertarian candidate. It was against the rules. Maybe. And maybe Maloney has changed things over at Young Americans for Liberty, but they they refuse to support libertarian candidates as well. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, OK, uh, if you've got a libertarian with a winnable race, you're not going to support them just because of party label. That seems counterintuitive. And, and then they then uh, they want libertarians to come over and support them. Right. Exactly. To, so, me, to me, I think what would be best push back and people tell you, go fuck yourself. That's yeah. why you're told to go fuck yourself, because it's been. That's Two decades, four decades of this kind of like, like go f no fuck you were superior to you, and then when you want to come in and quote take over the party, fuck you, like right. it, th those hurts, those slights, those comments, those don't go away, and those people who have been involved in the Libertarian Party for forty years that are delegates, and, and this is where Heist went wrong with the Mises Caucus I in general. These people don't ever sit down and have like conversations with old people that I can tell, like they, they just go after it. Like the way that they, the Mises caucus came in, we're young, we're arrogant. We're going to do things our way and you're going to submit because we're going to force you to, we're going to grow in popular and become, become the movement instead of like, you know, and I, I talked to people two, three years ago when this started, they didn't have conversations with longtime libertarians. They attacked them. They put them down. They dismissed them. And it was a continuation of what those people had gone through for 20 years. And so there's a resentment in the party towards them because of their attitude. But then it's not them that's the problem. It's leftists are infiltrating the party. Instead of like having a conversation, because the way that politics actually works is you coalition build and you have conversations with people who have the power. And so it was an arrogant entrance that has never been submitted and things have just gotten worse. You know, two of the worst things I've ever seen happen in the Libertarian Party. The first was Roger Stone. Yes, that Roger Stone. The worst thing I've ever seen anybody do in this party was when he was trying to run the Madam for New York City and the, the party challenged it because they were still, after 30 years smarting from Howard Stern, uh, when he ran as a Libertarian for governor and completely effed them. Uh, you, you had uh, the party person that ran against her in the libertarian primary Roger Stone took a a mailer that looked like when a sex offender moves into a town he put out a mailer that was an attack on that libertarian candidate and it was so devastating that that man had to move to a different state I think he moved to Florida it was the grossest most horrible thing I've ever seen and I know about it because his Stone's henchman bragged to me about it in 2012. The second worst thing I've ever seen is what happened to Joshua Smith, who Reinhold and I have no love for. What was done with his daughter was the grossest thing I've ever seen, uh, the second grossest thing that I've seen. And I know who is behind it. And that person was victim shaming in the 2016 campaign. You know, it, she, uh, she was living in Indiana at, at, at a certain point. That was really awful, and uh, and I feel bad that that poor girl was caught in the middle of that and was encouraged to do that. 
The next worst thing is the Mises chair from California, whatever her name is, and what she said to Eris Stewart. Like it's and those two things happened in the last three months. Like, are we just going to keep doing that? Are we going to keep going down that road? Are we going to keep treating each other like Roger Stone treats other people? Like, that doesn't seem like the kind of party that I want to be involved in. And that's why I tell my listeners don't get involved in the party because I don't want you to get hurt. I don't want to, you know, 